Hey, my name's Todd Peterson, and I'm the CEO of one of the largest tech firms in Utah. I recently sold my company for over $2 billion, and right now, I'm looking for the next big startup in Utah Valley. But what we're going to do, this is going to be a power pitch. The rules are they have four minutes, they have four slides. We're going to have two teams on deck waiting while one's presenting. They're going to present. Uh, Todd Peterson is going to have an opportunity, if he so chooses, to comment. If he doesn't so choose, he won't comment. You all get to listen and vote. And John explained the voting procedure. We're going to move through them as quickly as possible. We don't have enough time. There's going to be nine presenting. We don't have time for question and answer. So what you see is what you get. You're going to be uh, making decisions based on what they can tell you in that brief, very short four minutes. It's a big challenge. So with that, are we ready to start? You guys ready? Come on, let's hear some noise, yeah. Okay. Hi, my name is Spencer Quinn, and here with me today is Chris, and we represent the FiberFix team. We're really excited to be able to present to you today um, what FiberFix is and where we are. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about um, how FiberFix came to be. Um, it all started when we actually heard a story about a doctor who was traveling along on his ATV um, when his ATV broke down. And he was able to use casting tape that he carried um, in his personal first aid kit to repair his ATV and finish the trip. Now, when we heard this story, our team got thinking that there could potentially be a need for a rigid repair. And so we sought out in the development of a product that could address this need. Originally, we thought casting tape could be used not just to mend broken bones, but to fix all sorts of things. But in this process, we've actually developed an entirely new product that will be known and hereafter referred to as FiberFix. Um, now, FiberFix, what we've tried to do is effectively um, we've combined the versatility of duct tape with the strength of casting tape. And in so doing, we've created FiberFix. Now, FiberFix is super easy to use, comes in a box like this, and in each box is a pouch. And when you need to make a repair, you just open the pouch, you dip the tape in water, which activates the tape, and you wrap it around the broken item, and after about five minutes, it hardens like steel. Yes. Um, and so FiberFix can be used to fix everything from leaky pipes to broken automotive parts. Um, everything that you could find in your garage, FiberFix could fix. Now we actually did a, um, a, a local um, hardware store test with 18 unit display um, just to see how FiberFix would sell. And after a successful test up in the Highland store, Ace Hardware store, we actually received a letter from Ace Corporation inviting us to come to their national Ace Hardware convention. And there we were able to get into over 100 different Ace Hardware stores all over the US. And upon returning from this trip, we actually had a meeting with Sportsman's Warehouse, and they've accepted into all 46 um, Sportsman's Warehouse locations. <laughs> and this is kind of a snapshot of where FiberFix is today. Um, we've already received letters of intent and vendor documents from Costco and Home Depot. Um, we originally thought Home Depot would be one of the last mass retailers we'd be able to get into, but we just got off the phone with them yesterday, and they're extremely excited about FiberFix, and it looks like they'll be rolling out sooner than we expected. We've already received POs. Um, from Ace Hardware, QVC, Fastenal, Sportsman's Warehouse, True Value, and Sunrock. And are really excited to be able to be, uh, roll out FiberFix into these locations uh, this summer. Now for those of you who aren't familiar with QVC, QVC is broadcast into over 100 million homes here in the US. It's almost a third of the uh, US population. And we're, um, we'll be showing on QVC uh, this month. Um, again, we're really excited to be able to present to you today. I'm excited that you guys were able to come out and listen about FiberFix, and we'd like to answer any questions you have at this time. I, I've got one. So, yeah. so do you guys own patents on this or where, who owns the patents on this on this product or are yeah. there, can there be? Yeah, that's great. Uh, yeah, barriers to entry was something that we were actually really concerned to at the beginning. Um, so casting tape was the inspiration, but uh, Chris is our mechanical engineer and he actually took a physical trip to um, sub suppliers of resins and we have um, put 27 variations of a patent in place that protect this. Um, and we just wanted to demonstrate just how strong FiberFix is. So we have the cinder block here and we've just taken two pieces of two by two, we've wrapped it with FiberFix, and now Chris is gonna show us um, how, how, how strong the tape is really. 
Hi, I'm Peter Thorpe. Um, I'm a career firefighter and uh, the owner of Firevert here. I'm also a student in public safety. First, I just want to say thank you to everyone that's helped put this event on. It's great as a startup company to come into these events and to network and to get feedback from people, so thank you. Firevert is a business that will prevent the number one cause of home fires. It will save billions of dollars, save thousands of lives, and is anticipated being every home across America. I want to tell you a little bit about home fires in the U.S. The number one cause of home fires in the, in the U.S. is unintended cooking on a kitchen stove. Simply, people, what happens here is that people start cooking, they forget about it, and they have a kitchen fire. Every three and a half minutes, this occurs in the U.S. This all equates to over $724 million in property damage, over 4,800 injuries, and just under 500 people will lose their lives this year from these fires. Currently, all the products in the market right now that are made to prevent these fires, they require actual fire or flames before they'll do anything to stop the fires. The problem with this is kitchen fires smoke for hours and hours before there's any actual flames present. So the solution to this problem is right here in my hand. This is the fire vert. The fire vert is able to hear when the smoke alarm first sounds, and this will cut power to the stove, preventing the fire from ever starting. By doing this, we, we make all the other products in the market obsolete. How this works is you simply plug your stove into the fire vert here and the fire vert into the wall and it's ready to go. And it fits down in the void space where the stove is so the stove still fits flush the cabinets. When it hears the smoke alarm going off, it recognizes the stove is in the on position and it'll cut power to the stove, preventing the fire from starting. So here's kind of the solution. We remove the heat source and prevent the fire. Basically what the fire vert does is we home automate or interconnect the homeowner's smoke alarm with their stove, making it one unit. When I first had the idea of the fire vert, I read the book Nell It Then Scale It. So when we had the idea, we started going out and talking to all the industry leaders uh, and also and customers. I went up and talked to the fire marshal's office, who are the gur gurus in fire prevention. When I sat down with the state fire marshal's office, he loved the idea. He supported it. He invited us to go down and share this idea with all the fire marshals in the state of Utah. We were blown away by their response. They unanimously decided to support this idea and do what they could to see it through the, the life of it. Then we started talking to, to home alarm companies. We started some of the smaller ones, Mountain West Security, and moved our way up. Uh, Keith Allred there was super excited about it. He wanted an exclusivity to sell us to other alarm companies. But one thing we found from talking with uh, Peak One, Peak Alarm, and Protection One is the feedback was the same. All the alarm companies want to see this product work with the alarm panel as well. And so we integrated Z-Wave and Z-B, Z, Z bug technology, or Z-Wave technology. So this right here will communicate with the homeowner's <laughs> alarm panel. Currently where we're at right now for our product is we, this is a fully functioning sample from our, from our manufacturer. We have an order of 500 on the way right now. And we have uh, small retail shops such as Ace Hardware and Hutches that have agreed to carry this in their stores. And we're also in communications with others such as Community Control. We also have been talking with uh, insurance companies for the insurance companies to offer uh, the discounts and the premiums for people that have this in their home. So thank you. How much? <laughs> how much does it cost? How, how much does that cost? Great question. The consumer, so, or what's the? Our wholesale price is sixty-five, and a retail uh, eighty-nine. And and so um, you intend to get it into the market? Tell me how again. We have a couple of different avenues. We're really excited about the alarm companies that have showed a lot of interest. They already have sales reps out there that are pitching a smoke alarm that calls the fire department. So this is just an easy add-on that a, instead of just calling the fire department, this will prevent the number one cause of home fires. That and just small retail shops and just keep moving our way up. So just being in the security industry, retail doesn't tip, just to, you know, whatever my suggestion could be, doesn't work real well with, in, at least in this industry um, to this point. Um, is it, is, so it's super easy to install, it looks like? Yes. Could be installed? Yeah, and great point with the, the alarm industries, and you'd be the guru with that, that we wouldn't be retailing it to alarm companies. We'd be wholesaling, understanding they have a no, point system. No, no, system I'm saying retail, in, like retail shops, um, Ace, uh, Hardware, it just seems like the, anyway, well, we can talk about it later, but it doesn't seem sure. to work all that great re, in a retail environment. Doing, doing both. Stuff, yeah. Um, so, uh, and what, what kind of margins do you have on that business? So margins uh, for our wholesale, we have about, we can get down to a 50% margin, and then for our retail customers, they can have anywhere from a, a 41 to a 52% margin. Um, also, I always ask this, when it comes to, we build, we build our own products and services, so um, do you have patents on this? 
is it, it can you is it protectable? Can someone mimic this? Because they if you don't, they will. Yeah, um, great uh, we do have a utility patent filed over a year ago, and we have 36 claims in that with all different aspects of this. And can someone work around those? You know, you never, you never say never, right? But we feel pretty confident what we have. I'm, tr I'm thinking about doing it myself. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm kidding, I'm kidding. No. I wouldn't do that. So, some of our stuff is pretty unique that yeah. um, someone could not mimic it and still get away. We have some very narrow parts of our patent, but some very broad that were the first ones to patent part of it. Okay. And then your, your anticipated market size is what? Um, it's about 64. It's in, it's, Ask my business guy, but it's in the billions. That the total addressable market is in of, of this product, though. I'm saying, of this product, yeah. if it's all the electric stoves, so there's over there's over I think close to a closer billion electric stoves in the market right now. All right, thank you. Thank you. Time. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Tim Nelson. I'm with H2O Tech, and I'll be presenting WaterJet today. Now everybody hates the dental drill, and I think you'll agree with me that this is why. Isn't that horrible? I'm sorry I had to do that to you right after lunch. Don't worry, we have the technology to make that stop forever. So with the drill, that's, that's just what you expect when you go to the dentist. You've got that noise, the vibration, the heat, that terrible taste and smell, and that's just normal. Well, we can fix that with a water jet. With the water jet, there's absolutely no noise. We completely eliminate that sound. There's no heat, there's no vibration. Those are your biggest drivers for pain. So the average patient can have their cavity done without the need for shots and without the pain associated with it. Now we do have a fantastic market. There's over 181,000 active practicing dentists in the US and Canada right now. 4,000 new dentists graduate every year. So that's a 16% growth and that's projected to continue. So let's look at the numbers. The water jet retails for 6,800. Each dentist on average will work out of three rooms. So they need three drills. That's gonna be make their initial investment just over $20,000. Now that's a great investment in and of itself. However, we're gonna to add to that our recurring revenue model, which is generated through the use of our patent pending abrasive mixture. Now, dentists will fill 750 cavities a year. They're currently spending $8 to $10 per cavity in consumables. Our mixture will be $5 per cavity. So they're gonna save money every single procedure, plus generate almost $4,000 in protected recurring revenue for water jet. So a couple of things I wanna point out here. A Couple of graphs on here. The first one is this blue line. That's the number of dentists we project will be using the water jet by year five, which is right at 3,000. Now think, over those five years, 20,000 new graduates are gonna graduate. So if we only sell the, the new grads, we'd have to sell the 15% of them. Now 3,000 is not a huge number, but even at that number, it still puts us at a $50 million a year company, which is fantastic. But the cool part is, at year six, if we stopped selling units and only sold our abrasive mixture, we'd still generate $22.5 million. There again, the abrasive mixture has a patent that we're is pending, the main unit, the patent has been issued. Next slide. So we have competition out there. We're gonna look at the competition based on the four factors that dentists told us they care about. First is the drill. Drill's been around 100 years, we all know about it, we all hate it. Next was air abrasion. That's basically a miniature sandblaster. Air abrasion had great initial adoption, but doctors got tired of the dust cloud, so it's kind of faded away. The last one to enter the market was lasers. BioLase is by far the largest player in the laser market. They were able to capture 8% of the market in their first five years, and that's at $85,000 price tag. Then comes water jet. No noise, we can remove the material faster than any of the other methods. Water jet technology is the most precise cutting technology we know of, which means you get to keep more of your healthy tooth, creates a better patient experience. Currently in development, we'll have a production prototype and file for the FDA later this year. We plan to launch at the Chicago Midwinter Dental Convention February of next year. Uh, we are currently seeking a uh, $500,000 uh, angel round also. Thank you for your time. Please vote for us. Any questions? Yeah, so just a quick comment, and this is for you know, the rest of you that presented. This was probably the most clear and concise, at least in my opinion, maybe it wasn't, 
Um, I agree. Understanding, <laughs> you know, what they did, um, addressable market, competitive environment, pricing with competitors. I was going to ask you that. What what would it cost to buy something from someone else? The laser was, would you say, sixty-eight thousand? Eighty-five. Eighty-five thousand. Mm-hmm. Your for an office will be twenty thousand. Twenty thousand, sixty-eight hundred a, a unit. So anyway, that that was that's super important. Um, I love the recurring revenue piece to your business, big time. Um, but you have one major hurdle. It sounds like that's the FDA. What if? What if they say? What if they? Could they say no? They could. Will they say no? That's not really an option. It's a matter of how long that path will be. Right now, we've consulted with the top six FDA consulting firms in the nation. All six of them agree we'll be able to file by statement. We also have on our board uh, Clark Turner, who just took products through the FDA dental products with a Rebex. So we're fully prepared for either option, whether we have to do a study or not. We have both, all those contingencies in place. And what did you What did you do before this? Just as just curious. This is my third startup. Third startup, and did the other two go? Did they bomb? Did they? No, the first one went great. It was a direct sales marketing company. Second one was a dental staffing company, which I sold in 2009 to do this full time. Okay, good. I mean, I, I like this a lot. Actually, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. So we are in Environment, and today we're going to talk to you about a problem that landfills across the nation and the world are facing. Uh, plastic takes up a lot of space in landfills, and space is extremely expensive for landfills. It's an inconvenient truth, but 91% of the plastic that we use in the United States is thrown into landfills. In fact, I was recently talking, um, had lunch with a, an executive with waste management, and he told me, picked up a piece of plastic, and he said, I would never throw this in a recycling bin because it's going to still end up in a landfill. It's worth nothing for us, and we're going to throw it still into the landfill. The truth is, is that there needs to be a new solution to this because recycling, despite how great it is, isn't able to solve this increasingly difficult problem. And our solution is a simple, chemical, eco-friendly solution called PlazTech. So PlazTech gives landfills four key opportunities. The first is a 13 to 20 percent increase in capacity for the landfill. In other words, we're extending the life of the landfill because the plastic is only taking one to three years to degrade instead of thousands. It's shrinking that space down. The second is that because we're increasing methane, they can collect that for na- as a natural gas, a source of clean energy. Landfills are required by national law to collect methane, so they already have spent millions of dollars it takes to have that collection equipment in place, and so they're ready to take advantage of increased methane, which is increased revenues for them, and that's worth $5.8 million. In addition, they're able to collect on government grants because now they're producing more clean energy, and that's worth half a million dollars. And then finally, they're able to take advantage of that clean energy image and that and put that into their marketing efforts. So $3.1 million in capacity, $5.8 million in methane, half a million dollars in government credits, and then a green image. That's what we're giving landfills across the nation. But biodegradable plastics pose four main problems. It decreases self-stability, increases, increases product costs, it compromises the integrity of recycled plastics, and in fact, res- uh, biodegradable plastics have been banned in some states and some countries because of their effect on recycling machinery. We get around these problems by making the plastic biodegradable at the source. We make it biodegradable as it goes into a landfill. As plastic comes into a landfill, or as trash comes into a landfill, it is sprayed with our product, activated with a short amount of UV light, about two to four minutes, and then is deposited with the rest of the trash. Change slides, please. Now, there's about 1,754 active landfills in the US. Of these landfills, if we just click through to the end of this slide, please, using the LMOP program, 594 of these landfills actively collect methane. They are ready to take advantage of our product. Capturing just this market segment comes out to be about $2 billion in annual revenue. If we were to capture the additional 540 landfills that are capable of collecting methane, but don't already, that's $3.8 billion annually. Thank you. Hi, my name is David Hepworth. Uh, I'm with Lunchbox. I'm here to tell you about our exciting new business that combines free food with great advertising. We can start rolling through this. We deal with three customer segments. The hungry college student, he's our user. We also deal with college clubs and organizations. They're kind of our partner, and that's actually our go-to market strategy is working with these clubs. And then we're also working with businesses. These are the people trying to reach the college students, and there's quite a bit of them. Our potential clients include housing complexes, local restaurants and businesses. Here in Provo, we have a lot of summer sales team, but it's really anybody trying to reach college students. 
Now that you know who we're working with, this is kind of how it works. It's a free mobile app for students, and there's also an online website for those without smartphones. Students can get online, they can click what's for lunch, shows them all the events happening that day, and if you click on a specific event, it'll give you the details. Where that is, who's hosting it, what's gonna happen at that event. Um, we've had a lot of success so far. I mean, we've only been going for about seven weeks, but three weeks into this, we sent out a survey to 463 students at BYU. We found that 28% had already heard of Lunchbox. That was after three weeks. We found that 18% of our users are daily users, which is great for advertisers. And what we were most excited about is 51% of the students who had heard of Lunchbox heard of it through a friend. Word of mouth is our greatest grower. In fact, you can look at this next graph. Uh, this was kind of our timeline of growing, and you can see a line here. This is when we stopped advertising. That was at three weeks. From then, we just let it grow organically. And in the next three weeks, we grew even faster than the first three weeks. And based on these projections, we'll reach 15,000 students at BYU in December. Surprisingly enough, at BYU, we have a Disney History Club, and they sent us this message not too long ago. Before Lunchbox, we only had about 15 to 20 members show up for meetings and club events. Afterwards, we had between 30 to 50 students at each event. They used our app for three weeks, and they more than doubled in club membership, which really validated that this is a great tool to get the word out and reach students. And at the same time, students are building their social networks. We've also had a lot of great business validation. During our beta testing, during our beta testing, um, we had 17 events be paid to, paid to be advertised through Lunchbox. After that, we sat down and interviewed 15 companies, and with their help, we validated four alternative advertising methods that we're gonna start implementing. We then sent a survey across the country based off of these interviews. We reached 18 different universities. We found that 65% of business owners are unsatisfied with the current return they're receiving on their advertising. 83% said that they would use Lunchbox and were ready to use it. But what we found is there's simply too much demand. So many people wanted to start advertising through Lunchbox, we won't be able to service them all. Here's some of our numbers. In 2012, the US advertising re industry reached $140 billion. We're focusing on the top 1,000 colleges, which is a loan worth over $2 billion. And on the next slide, you can see some of our revenue projections in the next few years. But let me show you how we got those numbers. We, did, we worked with 25 individual businesses in Provo. We found out how much they were willing to spend on advertising through Lunchbox, and then really broke it down to how much advertising we can push through in a two semester block to students at BYU. At one school, we'll be able to make $126,000 in advertising in uh, fall winter semester. Scale that out to 1,000 schools, which is our goal. We're gonna make $126 million every single year. We're really excited about it. Lunchbox has become a very social, uh, social type thing over at BYU. If you look at the voting, I don't know if you saw it at the starting, we pushed out an event to all our users. We have about 3,000 of them now. They're starting to vote for us, and that's what kind of Lunchbox does. It has a lot of power behind it. So thanks for letting us come here. We're excited to be here if you have any questions. So again, I, and you explained a little bit, why would, I, why would I advertise I'm a local business, let's say I'm a whatever, why would I, and how much am I going to pay? You said the amount per school, talking to an individual business, how much are they going to pay you? So a you week, back, a day, a student, or how does, it, how does it work? I didn't get the... Yeah. So if you go back one slide, um, we have four different ad advertising, mes or revenue pr advertising methods. Um, I mean, is that, so is that 204 per business, per event? The average business said that they would want to spend to advertise per event, with, per event mm -hmm, for every single event. And we can run 223 of those events. Uh, relatively in the sem two semester block. Um, we were kind of looking at some of our competition. The Daily Universe is one of the big advertisers at BYU. They bring in over $700,000 of advertising revenue every single year, but that only reaches 5% of the student. We'll be able to push this out and we'll have over 50% of the student body using our app. And so you'll get a lot greater reach and honestly, if you paid us $700,000 to do it, I'd get close to 100% to do it. We're not gonna charge that much. We'll get a lot better reach of what you currently have. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, let me just tell you my story. I'm from Columbia. I moved here when I was going to sixth grade. And I could say two words, thank you and not me. <laughs> I didn't do it. That's all I could say in English. I had been taking English classes since I was in kindergarten. I knew how to write a few words, but I can speak at all. That's the problem we're trying to solve. There's, Thousands of language students who are drilling verbs, learning vocab, but when it comes time to actually talk and engage with someone, they can't do it. 
It's frustrating. We're reading books, grammars, it's all crazy. But the whole point of learning a language is to connect with people, to have a cult cultural interchange. That's not happening in the classroom. Why? Teachers are giving homework that's focused on grammar. And while that helps your language abilities, it doesn't help you interact with someone right away. So what we want to do is bring native speakers into the classroom through our platform. Our platform will allow students to connect with other students and exchange their language. So for example, let's say I'm learning French and Emilio, who is in France, is learning English. I hop on the platform, he practices for five minutes, I practice French for five minutes, and then he gives me feedback, I give him feedback, the feedback goes to the professor, and now the professor and I know what I can do to improve, what grammar I actually need to study, and what he can do to help me. So it's gonna be able to tailor uh, the teaching to students' needs. So that was, that was our idea. Connect students, who else is doing this? That's the first thing we ask. Who else is in the market is doing these things? And, sorry. <laughs> Sorry. So these are our competitors right now, but all they are focused on right now is delivering content at a high premium. If you look at Rosetta Stone, there you have to pay like seven hundred dollars just to you know start learning the language, and they only give you like five to seven opportunities to connect with a native speaker. In our platform, you're going to be able to connect with people on the go right away. The only other platform doing that is Verbling but they don't interact with the teacher. Uh, so that is our approach, learn by doing. You don't learn how to ride a bike by watching videos or reading books, you learn by doing it. And so right now there's a big need in the classroom for natives to be able to engage with students. Um, next. So that was our idea, let's go talk to the smart people. We talked to BYU professors, professors at UVU, and two schools who we're working with in Columbia. And across the board, they're saying, this is excellent. This should be around. We've already had Skype for a while. Why aren't we integrating this technology in the classroom? Uh, they're ready to start beta testing with a platform, which we built at a hackathon in New York City overnight, and we won that competition. And it's ready to go. All we need to do now is just iterate and keep fixing the system. But across the board, Students are saying, it makes sense. I'm taking a language class so I can talk to people. Why do I not get that opportunity yet? Why do I have to practice with people who don't know the language just like me? Is there a way I can prepare for my study abroad before going all the way to France to practice with natives? And so across the board, that's what we're hearing from professors and students. They're saying, yeah, I want to be able to talk to a native speaker right now. Uh, our revenue projections are based on uh, student membership fees. Um, there's been a lot of debate on whether we should charge the language department or the students, but students are already paying over $80 for a textbook. Um, most of them said they would pay, and by most of them, I mean like the hundreds of students we surveyed, they'd be willing to pay $30 for a semester to be able to hop in, in on our platform and talk to a native speaker. Todd. Okay. So, Todd, you're about 35, right, ish? Ten years ago. Yes. Okay, cool. So, um, about a, uh, thir 35 years before you or years ago, right before you were born, um, the last part of your body that was developing were your lungs, and that's the same for everyone. That's the last part of the body that develops, and that's actually why the number one cause of infant death is always respiratory related. Um, never before could a parent really look at their child and know whether or not they're breathing or um, how well they're breathing. So that's why we've developed a solution. The Outlet Baby Monitor. Next slide. So it's basically a smart sock that uses pulse oximetry, that thing you put on your finger when you go into the hospital and the doctor knows that, that your vital signs. We're able to send that to a relay monitor um, using RF and then that can connect to the cloud which can then send it to your phone or any device uh, for convenience. So basically if the baby stops breathing in the middle of the night, it sounds an alarm. Next. So some of the really cool things we can do, fonts kind of look funny, is not only are we tracking heart rate oxygen, but we can also do sleep tracking, which means uh, as a parent, you can be inspired and, uh, and feel better when you get push notifications like this. Hey, Anna got 50% less quality sleep last night. Or, next, something that you can't see right there, but it said uh, if your oxygen levels have been low for a few weeks, it can tell you to go see your pediatrician and maybe you could get diagnosed with many of these things before they become an issue. So this is what we've done. Um, 
All right. <laughs> if you'll go back and start it slowly. Uh, we've been listed on uh, some famous news, some big news uh, locations like uh, ABC, Huffington Post, Mashable. And then we're going to get 100 samples from our manufacturer in June. We've done over 120 hours of infant testing in 26 homes and done over seven overnight testing. Back. If you could go back, that's really important. Uh, that last guy you saw right there is a distributor. Uh, <laughs> they distribute a product called Snooza. Um, and we've talked to their CEO twice, and in two emails he told us he was willing to drop their Snooza brand. There you go. Uh, <laughs> He was able to drop their Snooza brand, which does $2 million in revenue for them, for our account. And he's actually flying from Australia to come see us uh, in a few weeks. So a um, lot, of, lot of excitement. And these guys, actually, no Rubbermaid, you guys know them. They do brands like, obviously, the Rubbermaid brands, Sharpie Marker and Graco Baby, as well as a couple other baby products, Aprika Baby and things like that. Uh, we've talked to their, uh, their VP of Business Development, uh, Todd Gerritsen. And uh, they're also connecting us with the right distributors. They're also extremely excited about our product. Next slide. So this is what we'll be doing uh, in the next few months. We'll be in product development until June. Click. So we'll be in product development until June, and then we'll get our 100 samples. Next. Uh, from China. And we'll start doing a little bit of testing on our side. We'll actually launch a Kickstarter. Next. Uh, we'll ship our, our first product in September, and then uh, we'll be raising some growth capital in January. So uh, because I know these questions are coming up, we'll sell through retailers like Babies R Us, Target, all those things. We can make it for $49. They're going to turn around and resell it for $120. That gives us a 63% uh, margin, and they get a 104% markup, or 52% margin. So it'll retail for anywhere between $250 to uh, $299. And how does that compare to that one product that's getting dumped? From that guy, the Australian Oh, yeah, guy. so really there's nothing else on the market right now. The only other products that are out there are sound monitors, oh. movement monitors, and video monitors. That one that, that, that guy wants to dump is a movement monitor. So basically if the baby stops moving for 20 seconds, it sounds an alarm. Oh, and how much does it cost, just out of curiosity? That one costs about 150 150 mm -hmm. okay. So 70% of the market right now is buying monitors in the $200 price point. So by pricing us right at uh, 250 to 300 is, is perfect. So, time Very cool. I like it. Uh, um, who's doing? Who does your engineering uh, in house? Do you have a? Is it you? Was it a? You no, know, look you don't want smart? me doing the engineering. Um, yeah, we have a whole team of engineers. The reason they didn't come is because we're hitting some deadlines right now, and they're, you know, sitting with dust and soldering, it's all cool. kinds of stuff. I right like. Now. I like so. it a lot. I would. I would have bought the product. We're done. I am forty-five. No more babies. Oh, done. Forty-five. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. So my name's Christian Watson. Uh, I own a company called Panic Solutions. We have a really unique uh, technology that quite possibly could change how all of you in this room use GPS devices. And if you don't have a GPS device, maybe you want one to track a, a certain asset that you have in your, your possession or in a company, um, we have a technology that could possibly change and revolutionize uh, how you're currently doing that. Um, a few years ago, maybe many of you will remember, um, there was a situation in New York City where there was an International Monetary Fund president who raped a couple of women, or one woman, in a, in a hotel. Soon after that, an Egyptian man uh, ra raped another woman. What happened was, that was interesting, was these women did not have a device to call for help. Um, I happened to be working in the alarm industry and was doing it for about 10 years and thought, well, we do this every day. Why couldn't we do something with what we currently had uh, for these hotels to be able to give them something for their maids. We started looking at all the different technologies that were available. We looked at our competitors and we found out that many of them were using Wi-Fi technology. Now Wi-Fi, as you know, is a big problem because it goes down all the time. Um, it's not reliable, um, but yet it will work indoors. Um, that was one of the main things we had to do is we had to solve this problem of being able to track something indoors. The second option was what we were currently using in the alarm industry, which was radio frequency. That was a fantastic solution, except for it required an immense amount of equipment to be able to do so. And one of our uh, potential customers is the MGM Grand, and we would, we would have to put a ton of equipment in there to be able to get that to work. So that wasn't an option. The third option was GPS. Um, GPS obviously does not work indoors. And so we knew that we just didn't have everything that was correct. So what I did was I actually visited the tech transfer office at BYU, and I ended up acquiring a patent that dealt with RFID. Um, soon after that, I got a lead for a gentleman who was um, developing a GPS technology that worked off of radio signals. 
um, free everyday signals that you use to use in, that you use for your car radio. Um, he has developed this and transferred that into a GPS location device. So, um, sorry, keep going. Perfect. So these were some of the concerns that they had. There's seven things here. One thing they had to do was outdoor tracking, indoor tracking, underground tracking, seamless indoor to outdoor transitioning. It cannot be jammed. Um, and the fourth thing was it can't be invasive. None of these other technologies solved this problem. Um, but when we combine these two patents, well, there's actually several patents, but when we combine these two technologies, we were able to meet all seven of these demands of these hotels. We soon realized that this wouldn't just work in just hotels, and so we started to look at other solutions. And so we called some of the largest providers of medical equipment in the, in the, in the world. Um, we found out that they would like to use this technology to track their medical devices. Um, we, have a, we have a letter of intent with one of the largest hotels here in the area to, uh, to uh, do a beta test. You don't have to hurry <laughs> to get to my last slide here. The last slide I want to show you is this is actually our, we have an alpha test currently, and we're currently working to put this technology into a, into a chip. This was an actual test that we took. This was what currently GPS will give you when you, when you run a, um, a test to see where you're located. The blue, lo the blue dot was where we were located at, and those are all the other pins that, uh, that gave us the, the, where we were located. The next slide shows us your, our actual alpha test. We did this inside of an actual shopping mall. We were buried deep inside, and we were able to take our device, and we were, and we were inside there, and this is it. it gave us the exact location of where we were essentially at. So to kind of go back on what we were doing, using radio frequencies and things like that, we were able to basically locate and track an actual person or a, an item deep inside of an actual building. Um, I got a couple seconds. Revenue model. So we have, uh, we, can, we have an API that we're going to be able to uh, uh, sell that will give us recurring revenue model. Um, there's installation charges. There's um, equipment charges. Um, there's several different things. The main thing is we have a, rev a recurring revenue model that, that is uh, probably second to none than what you're probably used to in, in, the, in the alarm industry. So, so as a side note, um, as I was reading through uh, this company, um, I was texting, and, and he walked up. What's tell me your name again? Christian. Christian. Walked up to me. I was texting uh, one of my internal tech guys to uh, reach out to this company. So I actually obviously like it a lot. See huge potential. How do you um, – There, I, I, I can think of a lot of different things you can do with this. How do you control um, – opportunities because sometimes too many opportunities is really bad. I mean, yeah. not that it's bad, but if you try to tackle too many things, you just are not good at one thing. Yeah. How do you, what are you going to focus on primarily first? You said you've got installation um, model, uh, a recurring revenue, which I love recurring revenue, obviously. How do you, how do you stay focused on, on, on the easiest, best thing to do that maximizes and, and not get distracted? That's a great question because we really have had, I mean, I could go to each one of everybody in this room and you'd all tell me a different solution for this, this technology. Um, so what we've basically decided to do is we've got it, we're working on our chip and we're going to put it in um, something about the size of a pager. And what that will essentially do, this will be our version 1.0. That'll essentially turn every GPS unit that you have either in your car or your phone to be able to, to work indoors. It'll basically be like a repeater is what it'll be essentially. So we're going to work on that. We're going to issue that. Um, we've, uh, and then go from there, we're going we're gonna to implement the, the panic device. Um, we think that'll be the easiest, most quickest solution to market. Um, several of the largest GPS manufacturers have already contacted us about buying that unit, the, 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 the repeater type thing. Um, and so that's what we're going to focus on. We're going to do a version 1.0 of just the chip that'll, that'll convert traditional GPS to be able to work indoors. Okay. Um, and then, uh, yeah, the, and then the last thing is I, I just want to make sure we, he actually knows people that work, that work you know, inside mm -hmm. of my company. So uh, I want to definitely talk because we'd be a great, you know, test. Um, we can test things fairly easily and, um, you know, can and kind of prove things out, you know, revenue models, what people are willing to pay, consumers, us as a business, whether it's licensing or, you know, hardware purchase or whatever. So Perfect. But uh, anyway, I like, I like it a lot. In Th fact, uh, um, it's in the, and I know we're not done yet, but in, in my view and in reading through this initially and then having a conversation with someone else, from a, from a market you know, perspective, I think this maybe has the, possibly the biggest potential from a revenue perspective if it's done properly. Yeah. Everything is about execution though. You can have the best technology, coolest stuff, and then 
you know, have a good sales model, good revenue model, good management team, uh, good financing structure. Yeah. And, you know. So this is actually, this was 67 billion devices of GPS were sold just in the United States alone last year. Um, and this is the breakdown of consumer to commercial to military. Um, we can eclipse that, um, second to none probably, um, in terms of what's going on because of the other revenue streams and things like that. These are just devices that, that were sold. So we can capture that and then some. Pokemos definitely fills a need. It's not as sexy as baby socks, but it definitely fills a need nonetheless. Uh, we were thinking about bringing an actual baby, but they didn't show up. Uh, it stands for Pest Control Management Software, PCMS. We build automation software and operation software and sales software for pest control businesses. The main problem pest control businesses have is they spend this much on, this much on operations uh, in, a, in a course of a year. This is a typical company with 10,000 clients. You know, they do quarterly pest control and, and such and such. Uh, the problem is they spend money where they don't need to spend money on multiple points of entry where they may, may take a customer's information at the door or give them a quote and then that representative of the company has to re-enter that information back at the office. The problem with that is you have to pay somebody to do it each time. When you get a big company with 10,000 clients, you have to pay a whole room full of people to do that, to do data entry. In addition to that, uh, papers get lost. You know, information gets uh, you know, inaccurately recorded. A lot of things happen in that process. So what happens is these companies spend huge amounts of money where they don't need to. Pokemos gives them a paperless system that automates a lot of their processes and saves that money for them. So go ahead and go to the next slide. That's not working. Uh, okay, so this, this line is one you need to focus on. Uh, we did a beta test with a company last summer on Virginia with about 10,000 uh, accounts. And this is how much money they spent in operations the previous year. This is how much money they spent in operations with Pokemos. <coughs> now, Pokemos gives them the ability to enter customers on iPads and iPhones and perform services and complete service invoices in the field, totally paperlessly. So there's no redundant data entry. Data is captured with integrity and reported with integrity as well. Right. So we, we build our, our technology with uh, HTML5 and CSS3, There's, it's very easy to cross-platform. You can use it on iPads, uh, iPhones, Androids, and the need that that fills is we have one competitor in the market that 70% of our customers use. So let me say that again. Out of the 43,000 plus pest control companies in the U.S. alone, 70% of them use one software. And that, that software was built 15 years ago. It has no ability to work on iPads or anything like that. Ours can work on iPads and give paperless options that, that people need. Our solution is simplicity. The problem with our competitor was it was designed as a very small system and then patchwork its way to an enterprise system. Ours takes the complexity out of it and only gives you what you need saving further time and, and headache. Uh, our go-to market right now is uh, to win in the trenches. We, we advertise with a few industry magazines right now that go to about 80,000 pest control operators. We advertise there and, and get a, a bunch of our clients there. We also do SEO, um, and we've seen some remarkable traction there. Just being honest, I read some of these, and it was a one-paragraph thing. And some of them, like, I was like, "Wow, I don't, I don't get that." Um, but pleasantly surprised by all of them in general. Um, you know, had a few favorites, I guess I would say. Um, um, I already, unfortunately, spilled the beans of my favorite favorite, um, <laughs> only because of you know my perceived you know market potential for that particular business, and um, you know me with the I guess the size and scale of the business I'm in right now. We actually launch, we're launching new businesses all the time. We just launched, you know, a new business, I don't know, 18 months ago. We're now the second largest residential solar company in the U.S. And we have another business we're like in beta mode right, right now. Um, and, you know, huge market potential. And, you know, I always try to get into things and say, okay, now I actually used to be, you know, very uh, myopic at what I thought the business, my business was or was capable of. 
Now I'm trying to think, what can we do? What are we great at and what can we do and what can we add to that to make it better for consumers, uh, better from an opportunity perspective for our employees? And, and so that's the one thing I would say with, with all of these. And as I was thinking about them, I'm like, okay, that's cool, the whole tape thing. What would you guys call yourself, the Fiber tape guru? Fix. Fiber fix. Um, you know, what else can that product be you know, used for? What's, what are the competitive uh, disadvantages of that to something else? And, and you know, what else can be made? And what else can the company turn into? Because you know, companies can become stale really, really fast in this um, current um, environment with technologies and business and the aggressive nature of you know, people are going to come at you in business. So, uh, but anyway, I, I, liked, I liked all of them. There wasn't one that I was like, oh, that's, that's just dumb. And I, believe me, I, I hear, I hear um, business ideas come to my office and I'm like, uh, what, are they, what are they thinking? Because no, no opportunity, no potential, no market, um, not, no real huge market potential. So those are things I always think about and I think all of these have, some more than others, but they all have you know, nice potential um, for growth. Some have a few challenges, some maybe need to think through um, the lingua what? Ulingua or lingu or whatever, I don't know. Um, so, but you got to think through how can you build a technology that's hard to replicate, that's easier to use. I mean, something that um, something someone one of your competitors can't come in and just say, "Okay, me too," and and we're going to do it better, faster, quicker, easier deployment. Um, th those are things I would try to think through because um, you you know in, in business you've got to offer best service for best price. What a fast-paced and great event we've had today, and that, and we appreciate Todd your being here today to help. Yeah us out and give us some of your guidance and certainly I think uh, we've got a view as to who the award if we had an award today for most likely to be acquired by Todd uh, we might have a winner there yes but <laughs> but we also had while we were here uh, a company that got the memo that we sent out earlier this week and and took it seriously that they could go corral uh, their posse of uh, followers on the internet and get them to vote for them and one company as you can see up on the board took us to school uh, today and uh, marshaled the forces of over a thousand voters online so if I could invite Lunchbox up here to join us very good congratulations guys this, uh, you're the Top Gun winner for the first, what we hope is the first annual Todd's Top 10 uh, event for power pitch companies. And uh, we want to congratulate you, wish you the best in your venture. And you get a prize today, a biggest cash prize of uh, $4,500, which we hope you'll put to good use. And uh, then the other winners here, you're all winners today of other competitions from schools around the valley You've already won something if you showed up here today because it was by invitation only. So everyone here that presented gets at least $500 and uh, y'all may want to get these guys to buy lunch.